Remember what color it was? I can't remember. Everything was kind of in a chaos. And, you know, I really didn't pay that 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 thing much attention. Sure. I knew it was uh, some kind of a tarp. You yes, know, sir. it wasn't a bad body bag. Because they had it, you know, more or less folded. And close as I can remember, they laid it down right there. When we began hearing rumors about a tarp covering Kevin and Don on the tracks, we questioned Saline County law enforcement about it. Rick Elmendorf and Chuck Talent uh, sat here in my living room and told us that they were absolutely certain that that was an optical illusion the train crew had seen, that uh, they had conducted tests on their clothing, which would have revealed fibers from a tarp impacted either on the clothing or the bodies themselves. We found out much later that that was a lie. Uh, they had never conducted tests on their clothing. And um, my interpretation is, of that is that um, they had some reason to lie, uh, uh, perhaps were even involved themselves. And what would turn out to be the most ironic twist in this case? Deputy Prosecutor Richard Garrett and his friend Defense Attorney Dan Harmon approached Linda Ives and convinced her that they would do everything in their power to catch those responsible for the murder of their son. Harmon was subsequently appointed special prosecutor to head the grand jury probe. However, as his investigation advanced, potential witnesses began turning up dead. May, 1988. Keith Coney, who was believed to be with Kevin and Don that night, told friends and family members that law enforcement officials were responsible for the murders. Two days later, he was killed when his motorcycle crashed while he was being chased. According to some officers, his throat had previously been slashed, and he was apparently fleeing his attackers when he lost control. However, this crucial information was left out of the final report. There was no autopsy or investigation. And I don't think it was an accident because he was fearing for his life, you know, a couple of months before. He said a couple of times that he knew people, that he was being watched and he was afraid. Mrs. Alexander says her son knew the two teenagers run over by the train, and she says he indicated to her he had been there when the boys had died, that he spotted two attackers. But he knew there was two there. I did try to get him to tell me who, and he, he was either afraid or didn't know. November, 1988. Keith McCaskill, who was allegedly at the tracks that night, turned over information he had about the boys' murders to Richard Garrett. Believing he had talked to the wrong people, McCaskill had made his own funeral arrangements, told family and friends goodbye, and within days was murdered himself, stabbed 113 times. His murder remains unsolved. On the night of uh, elections in 1988, uh, he took two pennies out of his pocket and threw them on the bar there at the wagon wheel and said, if Jim Steed loses this election, my life isn't worth two cents. And he was murdered that night. Harmon, Garrett, and members of the Arkansas police suddenly found themselves in the awkward position of having to try and convince the public that the deaths of these key witnesses coming at a crucial point in the investigations were merely a coincidence. I think that Mr. McCaskill was probably suffering from a lot of paranoia. And right now the indications are that nobody else was involved. Might there have been a reason though for his paranoia? I'm sure there was a reason for his paranoia. Uh, because he had talked to the police or the prosecutor? I don't know that that would be the reason. What about uh, the murder? Is it connected at all with the uh, grand jury investigation? Not that we know of. McCaskill was a witness in the Bryant train deaths investigation. Although police haven't ascertained a motive for the murder, they say there's no connection. This investigation to the deaths of Don Henry or Kevin Ives, and I don't foresee anything in, in uh, the pursuance of the rest of this investigation that would be uh, anything that would uh, make me change my mind. Those believing in a massive cover-up by police and elected officials, which included the possible murder of witnesses, watched in horror as the death toll continued to climb. January 1989. Greg Collins, who failed to appear after being subpoenaed to testify before Kevin and Don's grand jury, was killed by a shotgun blast to the face. His murder remains unsolved. March, 1989. Booney Bearden, 
a friend of both Coney and Collins disappeared. An article of Bearden's clothing was found in the vicinity where an anonymous caller claimed his murder had taken place. His body was never recovered. April 1989, Jeff Rhodes was murdered after telling his family he knew too much about Kevin, Don, and McCaskill's murders. Rhodes had been shot in the head and his remains set on fire in a dump. July 1989, Richard Winters, another grand jury witness, was gunned down during a robbery, which apparently was staged to cover his murder. His case remains unsolved. June 1990, Jordan Kettleson, who was believed to be connected to the McCaskill murder, was killed by a shotgun blast to the head. There was no police investigation, and his body was cremated before an autopsy could be performed. June 1995, Mike Samples, another grand jury witness, was shot to death. Sources claim he had been involved in retrieving drugs dropped from airplanes. Authorities have denied any connection between these cases and the murders of Kevin and Don. The people whose testimony might have solved this case years ago have systematically been eliminated. There apparently was a great deal of fear that these people could implicate very powerful players. The eight-month-long grand jury investigation into Kevin and Don's murder came to an abrupt halt December 31, 1988. Last-minute legal maneuvering by Harmon, Garrett, and presiding judge John Cole prevented the jurors from revealing their findings in the final report. The men and women of the grand jury were sent home frustrated that they had not been allowed to do their job. The Saline County Special Grand Jury has now disbanded. Three hours ago, it delivered its final report on the deaths of two teenage boys. But the grand jury was not allowed to do what it wanted. I know that because you could not repeat in the report much of the testimony that you heard and evidence that you received, that you are somewhat frustrated by it. And that's understandable. In the final analysis, I know that the grand jury hated to, at this point, to give it up. Because I think the public needs to know about the uh, seriousness of the drug problem here in Saline County and maybe other surrounding counties. It was now two and a half years since the incident of the boys on the tracks. Saline County Deputy Prosecutor Jean Duffy was asked to head up the newly created drug task force. The job would require her to investigate drug trafficking in a three-county area of Arkansas, including Saline County. However, on the day she was appointed, her boss, Prosecutor Gary Arnold, gave her a peculiar command. Gary Arnold came into my office, stood in front of my desk, looked me straight in the face and said, Jean, you are not to use the drug task force to investigate any public official. He turned on his heel and marched out. Now, as startling as that statement might sound, I really didn't think that it was going to pose any kind of problem because at that time I didn't have any indication that there was any public official in our judicial district who was involved in drugs. Almost immediately, Jean's undercover team discovered that a number of public officials in her district were indeed involved in drug trafficking. Gary Arnold's directive had now become a dilemma. Jean couldn't include the information in her reports because Arnold would know she was disobeying orders. Also, in case Arnold himself was involved in the corruption, she didn't want him to have access to this information. There was, however, a solution. I knew at the time that there had been a federal investigation going on for about nine months into the public official corruption in Saline County which was being headed by Assistant U.S. Attorney Bob Govar. So Govar seemed to be the likely person to take this information to, which I did, and he was appreciative because it supported the information that he had already been gathering, plus added to and gave him new information to uh, broaden his investigation. Bob Govar had been assigned by U.S. Attorney Chuck Banks to head the Federal Organized Crime and Drug Enforcement Task Force. Govar had already developed substantial information linking public officials to drug activities by the time Gene Duffy's task force was operational. In July of 1990, one of Gene Duffy's undercover officers developed evidence 
linking the train deaths to public officials and drugs. Three years had passed since the boys had been killed, and Jean had no way of knowing that her drug task force was about to be shut down for nearly solving Kevin and Don's murders. It didn't occur to me that it was appropriate for our drug task force to reopen the case of the boys on the track until one of my undercover officers came to me and told me that not only was the case drug related, but it was also solvable. He asked permission to investigate and I agreed to that and told him that we would take our information then to Bob Govar. Ironically, Dan Harmon and Richard Garrett, the very same men who had conducted the grand jury investigation of Kevin and Don's murders, were two of the main targets of Govar's drug and corruption investigation. Linda Ives, who for years had believed Harmon and Garrett were sincerely trying to solve her son's murder, now realized they were the ones orchestrating the cover-up. We certainly don't have any suspects at uh, this point in time. It's been quite a while. Uh, and, and I, I really didn't anticipate that it would take this long when we first started. I'm frustrated in the amount of time that it's taken. Frustrated that we weren't able to accomplish some things we probably should have been able to. Whatever comes out of it, if someone's charged or not charged, the, the grand jury has done a tremendous job. But it still will leave the open question, where, uh, if the boys were murdered, who did it? Well, until it's solved, that's correct. To make matters worse, Harmon suddenly became the prosecutor-elect for a three-county district, which included Saline County. Harmon, who had friends in the Arkansas press, wasted no time in launching a massive media smear campaign against Gene Duffy. He immediately began a uh, media crusade against me. First of all, using uh, the Benton Courier and Linda Hollenbeck as the reporter, and he also used the uh, Arkansas Democrat and Doug Thompson as the reporter. And for some reason, these two people would write anything that he said to them. They didn't care anything about substantiating anything he said. They just reported it. In the next five months, there were over 200 newspaper articles crucifying my reputation. Not one thing that they alleged was truthful. They had me stealing federal funds. They had me making illegal arrests. Um, every allegation that would, might destroy my credibility was made. I could have played the same game Harmon was playing and reported to the media the information that I had about him and truth would have been on my side, but this would have jeopardized the federal investigation. And I wasn't so concerned about public opinion of me because I felt like in the end all the truth was going to come out because at this point I still had faith in the judicial system. Harmon was pounding Gene from every angle. He influenced the filing of a $1.2 million lawsuit against Gene. He facilitated the sabotage of task force records through a fiscal officer who was reporting to Harmon. And he was threatening task force informants whose names had been given to him by a task force agent Gene had fired. By September of 1990, Harmon's smear campaign had reached a critical point, and Gene knew that unless Harmon was indicted, her days as head of the task force were numbered. Govar repeatedly assured Gene that indictments against Harmon and others were imminent, but they did not come in time to save Gene's job. According to Govar, his boss, U.S. Attorney Chuck Banks, was the holdup. The members of my board of directors had warned me for several weeks that they were not going to be able to continue to support me in the face of all of the bad publicity. And in fact, when they did fire me finally in November, it was not because of anything that I had done wrong, but because I had become, in their opinion, ineffective because of all of the bad press. This is a test of the emergency bonehead system. This is only a test. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, join us next week for more government deceit, political cover-ups, murder, and CIA drug running, and much, much more. That's right. Join us next week for the conclusion of Obstruction of Justice, the main connection. Peace. And emergency bong hitting instruction. This concludes this test of the emergency bong hit system. Quit playing games with God. Wake up, America.